All right, so looking at question 10 here, without even reading it, you see it says before collision, after collision. And so the word collision gives you a clue that you're gonna wanna use the law of conservation of linear momentum to solve this. And so what is the law of conservation of linear momentum? It says that the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. Regardless of the type of collision that we're dealing with, this is always true. Initial momentum equals final momentum. Here we can kind of consider that like this might be an object with mass m1. Here might be an object with mass m2 and it has initial speeds u1 and u2 respectively. After the collision, mass one is going at speed v1 and mass two is going at speed v2. They kind of explain it all in the paragraph here. So if we took this and expanded it, we'd have something like the mass of object one times its initial velocity. So that's its momentum. The momentum of this object is mass times velocity. Object two has initial momentum equal to this. So the sum of the individual momenta of all the particles initially equals the sum of the momenta of all the particles after the collision. So on the right side of this, I'm gonna sort of just list what I've got going on over here. Um, M, to V, I'm sorry, M1, V1, plus M2, V2. So far, so good. Now, both of these questions, nine and 10 here, talk about a perfectly elastic collision, perfectly elastic collision. So a perfectly elastic collision is one where not only is the momentum conserved, but the kinetic energy is also conserved. So the kinetic energy of all the particles before will equal the sum of all the kinetic energy after the collision. And that really is enough now that we can answer question nine. It says, which statement about a perfectly elastic collision between two bodies in an isolated system is correct? A, both the kinetic energy and the momentum are conserved. In a perfectly elastic collision, both quantities are conserved. In all collisions, momentum is conserved. So reading something like total momentum is not conserved, that's just wrong. Total momentum is not, uh, nor total momentum conserved, that's wrong. It's always going to be wrong. Momentum is always conserved without exception for every interaction in the universe. Okay, in a closed system, in an isolated system. So I guess a couple of qualifying sort of terms. By definition, a perfectly elastic collision is one where the kinetic energy is also conserved. Now, there's a consequence of that idea that will help us solve question 10 down. And we're going to work through it right now. Let's go ahead and do that. That seems like a good place, isn't it? All right, so we've got the initial momentum equals the final momentum, which we said m1 u1 plus m2 u2 equals m1 v1 plus m2 v2. That's true for all collisions. Because this is a perfectly elastic collision, we know that what else is true, the initial kinetic energy equals the final kinetic energy. And we know how to calculate kinetic energy in this class. We know that kinetic energy is one half m squared. So one half m1 u1 squared plus one half m2 u2 squared equals the final kinetic energy, one half m1 v1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared. Good. So you can already see all the fun that we're about to have right now. Right? You can already anticipate it. If we know that the collision is perfectly 
elastic, one of the things we can do is start to do an energy sort of calculation and say like, okay, well, maybe we're going to solve for the final velocity of something. We know everything else about it. We're given the masses or something like that. This wasn't that type of problem, right? All of our answer choices were like summing the, the speed. So like one was either positive or negative, U1, U2, the mass sort of went away there. So that gives us a clue about sort of what we're going to do here. With this. We're going to work through an, an idea here that will give us a final answer that's incredibly useful. And we don't have to work through the same idea every time. We'll just sort of have a takeaway at the end of this that goes, okay, that's nice to know. Let's keep that in mind for every other question like this that we ever encounter in the future. Because we don't want to have to do what we're about to do every time. This is, this is something to do once or twice in your life. Get the takeaway from it and go, okay, now we know that that's true. We'll use that idea again and again. So mathematically, what can we do with these equations? We're going to get our, our M1s together. So put our M1s on the left side, put our M2s together on the right side. So that means I'm going to subtract this term from both sides, and I'm going to subtract this term from both sides. So that's going to have the effect of M1U1 minus M1V1, right? If I subtract this from both sides, then it goes away over here and it's negative on this side. Likewise, keep this term positive on the right side, subtract M2. U2 from both sides, and I get this. Make sure your Vs are distinct from your Us. They can be easily confused. Factor out M1. U1 minus V1. Over here, factor out M2. We have V2 minus U2. And that's about as far as we can take that. That's, that's basically all we can do with that. We could get our like terms, our M1s together, and our M2s together, we can factor it out, and there we go. There's, there's a nice little equation. Any suggestions for how to move forward on the kinetic energy conservation equation? Which remember, by definition, if it's perfectly elastic, this has to be true. So now we're gonna say, okay, if that's true, then what else is true here? Anybody? What can we do here? We kind of want to do the same thing here, but before we do any of that, is there a simplification we can make? Let's just double everything. Multiply that by two, that by two, that by two, that by two, double everything. And it stays the same equation, right? As long as we double everything. And it effectively just gets rid of the fraction. So M1, U1 squared plus M2, U2 squared equals M1, U1 squared plus M2, V2. Get rid of the fraction. Double everything, right? Two times a half is one. One times that is just that and stuff. Now I'll get the M1s together, right? So it's like M1, U1 squared minus this term. M1, V1 squared. So I subtract it from both sides. So it's negative over here. Likewise, subtract M2, U2 squared from both sides. So this term, M2, V2 squared is positive on the right side. Subtract this term. M2 U2 squared. Same thing we did over here, factor out our M1. So we get U1 squared minus U1 squared equals now 2 V2 squared minus U2. Good. Anybody see what we've got here inside the parentheses? Good. The, the microphone is a bit muffled, so you two can appreciate the fact that all the students in fourth period in unison together said, difference of two squares. Yeah, difference of two squares. Very good, everybody. We have here the difference of two squares. And so we know how that's going to factor. Maybe you call it unfoiling it. I don't know. I don't know if teachers say that. We're going to unfoil this. Prove to yourself that if you were to FOIL this or distribute, <clears throat> however you multiply your binomials, you'd get back to that. Okay, prove that to yourself real quick while I write it out. Okay, there you go. U1 times U1 is U1 squared. Outside, we have positive U1, V1, minus U1, V1. So the middle term cancels, and then negative V1 squared to the last term. So if you FOIL these two, you get back to that, right? The difference of two squares factors like this. Very 
we go with that, middle term cancel, same thing here. We factor this down, we unfoil it, so to speak, we get these terms. So the kinetic energy sort of becomes this, and the momentum conservation becomes this. And you see how they look kind of the same a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide this entire equation into this entire equation. Now, first and second period, they're going to watch this video and they're going to say, hey, wait a minute, we weren't ready for that. But fourth period, I feel like you guys are. And I didn't care. The second period, I'm like, I don't care if you guys aren't ready. We're just going to do it. We're just going to divide this whole equation into this whole one. You know, buckle up and get ready to go. Fourth period, they're like, we can handle that. That's no big deal. M1, U1 minus V1 equals M2, V2 minus U2. No big deal for fourth period. M1 cancel, this one cancels, this one cancels, and that one cancels. Nice. So we're just left with this. U1 plus V1 equals V2 plus U2. It's starting to look like the answers that we've got here. See, it's perfectly clear now. Oh, of course, yes, now I can clearly see what's going on, right? Absolutely. The takeaway here, what this actually means, I'm gonna get my use together now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewrite this as U1 minus U2 equals V2 minus V1. See what I did here? I, I just subtracted this U2 from both sides, so it's this, and I subtracted this V1 from both sides, so it's this. Now, what this means right here, special, so I put it inside of the circle. This means the relative speed of approach equals the relative speed of separation. All right, let's see if I can fit that all in here. The relative speed of approach. That's this part, the relative speed of approach, how fast the objects see each other initially equals the relative speed of separation, which is what that is saying over there. The relative speed of separation. Now that's the takeaway. That's what you wanna get down in your notebook. If you didn't write any of this math down, that's fine, but definitely get this down. The relative speed of approach equals the relative speed of separation. If you've got all that down and now you're, you're like, what, we didn't need to get any of that? No, it's good stuff. You, you want it, trust me, you want it. That's good stuff right there. But if that's all meaningless to your future self as you study for the final, you know, or the midterm, they're like, okay, we did a bunch of math that day. Like, what was going on there? The takeaway is this, the relative speed of approach equals the relative speed of separation for a perfectly elastic collision. If the kinetic energy is conserved, there's a consequence of that idea, which is this. However fast the objects see each other initially, they will see each other after separation. Because they don't lose any kinetic energy, it's perfectly bouncy, right? Perfectly elastic. We need to couple this truth with one other important note, which is how do we calculate relative speed? I'm gonna write that over here in this box. Out. to calculate relative speed. If objects travel in the same direction same subtract Subtract their speed to calculate relative speed. And you know, there's two types of people in the world. Those that can extrapolate from incomplete information. Okay. So get the rest of that note down. If the objects travel in the same direction, subtract their speed to calculate relative speed. 
if the objects travel in the opposite direction, add their speeds to calculate relative speeds. Now, hopefully you got both of those notes down in your notebook. If not, just pause the video and rewind it and get the previous one. That's what I was trying to say, like there's two types of people in the world, those that can extrapolate from incomplete information. And now it's perfectly clear. Of course, we have it. So, what's the right answer to that? Oh, it says two spheres approach each other along the same straight line. So, linear momentum. The speeds are u1 and u2 before they collide. After the collision, the spheres separate with speeds of u1 and u2 in the direction shown. The collision is perfectly elastic. That is to say, the kinetic energy is conserved. Which equation must be correct? Now, what did you say the answer was? Say it again. G or D? D, D as in delta, correct. Because before the collision, they're going in opposite direction. So we add their speed to calculate the relative speed. After the collision, they're going in the same direction. So we subtract their speeds to calculate the relative speed. The relative speed of approach equals the relative speed of separation when the collision is perfectly elastic, which it tells us it is here. So choice D is correct because it has the correct rule for how do we add, how do we calculate relative speed? If you said, oh, perfectly elastic, that means relative speed of approach equals relative speed of separation then you still have to know, well, how do we calculate relative speeds based on the direction of traveling? The way I like to think about it is with a familiar example. If you're traveling down the interstate at 70 miles per hour north, 70 miles per hour north, and somebody travels in the same direction going 75 miles per hour also north, how fast does that Car appear to you to be passing you. It doesn't look like they're going 75, right? Because you're sort of keeping up with 70 miles per hour of their total velocity. So this is the example where same direction subtract. That car appears to pass you at five miles per hour, right? Like, oh, it's barely sort of moving relative to you. It's going faster than you. And even though you know it's going like 75, it only seems like it's going like a little five miles per hour compared to your motion. Contrast that with you're going 75 miles per hour north and a car is going 75 miles per hour south in the other lane, how fast do you see each other? It appears that you pass cars in the other lane at 150 miles per hour. You add those speeds to calculate the relative speed of you know, approach. So when things travel in opposite directions, just imagine like a car passing, you know, in the opposite direction on the interstate, it, it is passing by you very fast because you're sort of catching up to it as it catches up to you, right? Like you're speeding towards each other. And so you add those speeds to calculate the relative speed. And so that's a key idea to keep in mind when collisions are perfectly elastic. Now, when are collisions perfectly elastic? Never. Usually collisions are inelastic or somewhat inelastic. The only time collisions are perfectly elastic, I mean, just think about it. Like when, when things collide, when do they never lose any energy? Like some of the kinetic energy when objects collide is usually converted into other forms of energy, like heat energy or sound energy or energy required to crumple the sort of material. Like two cars collide, they deform their shapes. It costs energy to do that. Um, their sound wave, even bumper cars, which are sort of designed to be bouncy, you know, like bumper cars, you collide, you bounce off. Even then there's sound energy, there's heat energy, there's energy losses. So the only things that collide with perfect elasticity are molecules, gas molecules. Kinetic molecular theory and chemistry has an assumption that gases collide with perfect elasticity. They do not lose any of their kinetic energy. And so we'll see a very typical sort of physics problem that looks like
this one, where a ball is thrown upwards and hits a ceiling and it bounces off. And you're like, okay, a wall ball problem. But think about how this could be generally applicable as like a gas particle crashes into your skin and changes its direction. So you're feeling air pressure right now because of the trillions of air particles that are crashing into your skin and then changing their direction. So a force is exerted to change something's direction. Force is the rate of change of momentum. If a massive particle changes its direction, it must have been accelerated. And what causes acceleration? Forces do. And so the source of air pressure, atmospheric pressure, is the cumulative effect of all of these air particles crashing into surfaces like your skin or like the walls of a tire or a balloon, right? So this gives rise to pressure. The other lab work we're going to do this week is kind of along these lines. This is an inelastic collision. You can see here a steel ball is moving and it's going to crash into this block. And then the key language here is remains embedded in it. So let me give you for completion's sake the perfectly inelastic collision equation. Still momentum is conserved, right? In any collision, momentum is conserved. But here we've got like mass one, initial velocity one, like this steel ball, it has mass four, it has velocity 45. It's gonna crash into this guy, mass two, initial velocity two. Now, usually with ballistic pendulum, this is stationary. We just leave the target stationary and we fire a projectile into some stationary target. If they collide and stick together, like the bullet embeds itself in the block, or they somehow stick together like clay, you know, it just sticks to it, then the right side is gonna look like this. This plus sign right here means perfectly inelastic, right? They stick together and now it's some new object equal in mass to the sum of the individual masses. And that new object, M1 plus M2, is gonna travel at some velocity, we usually call it V prime. So like these objects now share a velocity, right? Because it's just one new object. So anytime we read something like this, embedded in it, remains embedded in it, or sticks together, that's an inelastic collision, and it's going to look like this. So this is the equation you want in your notes for a perfectly inelastic collision. The one that we just had was for perfectly elastic collisions. That's where the relative speed of approach equals the relative speed of separation. The two different types of collisions that we study with momentum conservation perfectly elastic collisions, which have their own sort of truths, and perfectly inelastic collisions, which this is what's true there, right? It's just some new object traveling at a shared speed V prime. Most collisions are somewhat inelastic, like some of the kinetic energy is converted into other forms, but they, they won't like stick together. So they collide, they bounce off, but something lost energy, it converted its kinetic energy into some other form. So that's a typical sort of collision. All right, so just as a quick review, momentum conservation says that the initial momentum of all the particles before the collision is equal to the final momentum of all the particles after the collision. The sum of the individual momenta before equals the sum of the individual momenta after the collision. In a perfectly elastic collision, kinetic energy is also conserved, which means as a consequence, the relative speed of approach equals the relative speed of separation. However fast the objects see each other before the collision, they will see each other after the collision. And we calculate relative speed by considering if things travel in the opposite direction, you add their speeds to calculate relative speed. And when objects travel in the same direction, we subtract their speeds to calculate relative speed. 